Welcome to The Practice Podcast, a show created by lawyers to help lawyers in life and business without all the complicated lawyer language. Let's welcome Bast Amron founders and your hosts, Jeff Bast and Brett Amron. Welcome to a special edition of The Practice Podcast. This episode is a recording of a panel discussion from Bast Amron's third annual Business Advantage Forum, which took place on November 13th, 2020. The forum is a learning event we host and underwrite each year with all proceeds donated to a charitable organization. This panel is called Staying Healthy in a Remote Work Environment, Balancing Mental, Physical, and Nutritional Health at Home. If you enjoy this, please check out other panels on this podcast, and we hope you will join us for our next Business Advantage Forum. You can find information on our website at bastamron.com. Staying healthy in a remote work environment, balancing mental, physical, and nutritional health at home. I'm excited about this topic and this panel. Health and wellness are passions of mine, and I always love to learn more. I am the first to admit I know very, very little other than what is good for me, or I think is good for me anyway. We have a tremendously talented group of panelists today, and if I were to read all of their accomplishments or accolades, we'd be here for a really long time. So let me summarize directly to their full bios, which was sent out to you prior to today. First, Krista Gurka. Krista is the founder and CEO of Pilates in the Grove, is a board-certified orthopedic physical therapist specializing in Pilates-based fitness, injury prevention, and wellness. Krista is the Pilates and wellness therapist for the Eastern Conference champion Miami Heat. Yay, go Heat. And serves as chairperson for the Miami-Dade County Wellness Coalition. Krista's passion for empowering female entrepreneurs led her to her most recent professional venture as business strategist and mentor to female business owners looking to start and scale their own healthcare and wellness companies. Welcome, Krista. Scott Rogers. Scott is the director of the Mindfulness in Law program and lecturer in law at University of Miami School of Law. He has authored many books, created a program and works with law school, faculty, and administrators across the country interested in developing mindfulness programs, and has spoken to thousands of legal professionals, including lawyers, judges, law professors, and law students. He has appeared on television, national public radio, and been interviewed for magazines and newspapers across the country. Scott is co-chair of the Dade County Bar Association and Federal Bar Association's Mindfulness and Law Task Force, and is co-founder of the University of Miami Mindfulness Research and Practice Initiative. Welcome, Scott. Saida Segovia-Taylor is the CEO and Executive Director of Organic Oneness, a nonprofit based in Chicago. Organic Oneness is an educational and community-building organization that promotes the oneness of humanity and its interconnectedness with the environment. Saida has devoted the past 25 years to improving the holistic health of young people. She has worked with high-profile nonprofits in Chicago alongside city agencies to bring opportunities to youth and under-resourced Black and Latino communities. Welcome, Saida. Monica Oslander Moreno. Monica is a registered dietitian and nutritionist and is the founder of Essence Nutrition, a group practice of eight registered dietitians who work with pediatrics and adults and oversees all of Essence's private client work while focusing on Essence's corporate wellness programming, speaking engagements, nonprofit client nutrition, consulting services, school wellness programming, and marketing. Monica is the dietitian from the Miami Marlins and is the Visiting Dietitian Specialist at Ocean Reef Resort and Club. And perhaps most importantly, Monica is a new mom to a 10-month-old baby boy. Congratulations, Monica, and welcome. So I want to get this thing started. Everyone's schedules have been completely disrupted as a result of COVID. We have people working at home, schooling at home. People are acting as we've heard in the other panels, and we all know part-time or full-time teachers, daycare workers, plus they've got to do their job, but now they're sometimes not focusing on themselves. Krista, I'm going to go first to you. What are some of the changes you've seen in the way that people either abandon exercise, how they're dealing with their own physical exercise, or how are they trying to get their exercise? What changes have you seen? Well, thank you guys for having me again. So I'm honored to be here. There have actually already been, because this has been going on now for eight months, even longer in other parts of the world. So on a general basis, only about 23% of Americans get the recommended 
movement exercise, which is usually about two and a half hours worth of moderate exercise per week. And only about 23% of people generally get that in the United States. So now you take people that are working from home and initially you might think, well, they have more time. They don't have to go travel, sit in traffic. Studies have actually shown now that people are getting actually even less exercise than that, especially if you think about the population that we have called the most critical, the marginalized population that are the most vulnerable right now. Some of these people have not left their home, right? So think of the loss of exercise there. And with a work environment, similar to the last panel that they were talking about, we have found that more people are actually sitting longer during the day than they would when they were in their office. Because like they've spoken about in, oh, it's that normal, hey, can I stop by your office and you know have lunch or have a few minutes or they're walking to the restroom and they see somebody in the hallway. So we're actually finding that people are one, sitting longer. Number two, people at home don't always have the best workstation. So they're Zooming from the couch or from a computer that, by the way, I'm gonna take my computer but I don't know how many of you have seen this view in your meetings, right? So they're looking down all day. So we've seen a significant decrease in the amount of exercise that people are actually doing and an increase in the amount of time they're actually being sedentary. How bad is it? I was reading a book talking about exercise and movement and how bad sitting is for you as a human being. How bad is it for you, Krista, for your physical being? I mean, you know, they have these whole things of like, you know, sitting is the new smoking. Mm -hmm. Um, The truth of the matter is, it's not even necessarily sitting. It's being in a static posture for a prolonged period of time. Because by the way, you could be a hairstylist that stands all day and their lack of motion is equally detrimental to them, right? Or possibly a mechanic that's under a car and looking up. So it's static postures. We just know that people that sit, they just don't move very often. And not only what that does to their lung and respiratory capacity, but what that does to your front of your body and muscles and things like that. So it's less about the sitting and just really more about being in a static posture for an extended period of time. And I know most of us focus on physical health. Saida, how important is mental health in all of this? Loaded question, I know. Equally important because our physical self won't be able to function if our mental self is not centered and balanced. And it all goes hand in hand. It's the interconnectedness of our entire self. We can't say that our brain is healthy and our heart is not affected by it or something else is happening in our lungs and our kidneys are not affected. Once one thing is thrown off completely, the entire being is thrown off. So if you want to look at the analogy of like a car, that's like, The outer car is us working out. Yeah, our muscles are great. Everything's intact. The tires are Mm -hmm. on. They're tight. They're the way they're supposed to be. And then the fluids is our nutrition. So like the oil, the gas, everything to help us go. But I look at the person sitting in the car as our mental health. And so if they're drunk, if they're tired, that car is not going to function the way it's supposed to. And it's going to be dangerous for everyone around us. So it's important for us to take time to figure out how to be centered, how to breathe, how to relax, and take us back to a mental state of understanding what is our purpose as a person. We lose that a lot in this era. And now with COVID and everything, if everyone in the entire globe, because remember, everyone's going through the same thing right now. But for some reason, we're still functioning, trying to get ahead but ahead of who? (laughs) You know, if everyone is stationed and stagnant, who are we racing against? (laughs) And so this is a good time for the entire world to reflect and just breathe for a second and recalculate how we do things. Right now, there are a whole bunch of reports that are showing that the dentists are seeing patients with more cracked teeth more than ever. And that's because we're all so stressed out and we might be able to maintain it. We might be functioning stressed out people. But when we go to sleep, that's when the reality kicks in. That's when our nightmares happen. That's when we can't sleep. If we do go to sleep, we start grinding our teeth. 
So it's something to really pay attention to as an individual and as a workplace, as a company, and as a community. So we definitely have to be talking about this more. So I appreciate you having me on the panel. Yeah. And I want to get back to that. I want to ask Scott in the vein of more of the mental side of things and mental health. I hear the term mindfulness and I think relaxation or relieving stress, but I know that's not accurate. So tell us what is mindfulness? That's a good question, Brett. There is a relaxation piece to it, to be sure, in the sense that when we're more present for our experience and not lost in the stories that we're having about our experience, for example, when we're more connected, as Saida so importantly reminds us, to this body in a way that is able to be present for this body as it takes care of itself and as we take care of it, we're more likely to be more calm, stable, steady, and relaxed because we're less likely to have a mind wandering all over the place, which is the nature of the mind. There's nothing fundamentally wrong or problematic with that. And the piece that sort of lifts up from relaxation, though it's very important not to lose track of that, but there are many, many ways of cultivating a more relaxed, calm state. Mindfulness practices would be just one of a great many and not necessarily always the most fruitful one in any given moment in time. It's seeing things more clearly, being more present for one's experience, meaning being more attentive and aware two important capacities that are oftentimes confused, but we probably have a sense of what attentive is and what aware is. And when we sort of find that sweet spot of attentive and aware, because every moment calls for a different sort of relationship to these two very important qualities and capacities that we already have, that we were born with, but that we can develop and cultivate, then that's a game changer in a way that sort of follows us through the many moments of our life and the decisions we make regarding eating and exercise and interacting with people and the work that we do and the work that we choose not to do because we're more in alignment with the moment as it's actually playing out. And so mindfulness, which can be practices that can help us in that regard, really cultivate a way of being more mindfully aware, which is that larger aspect of our natures for which there are many things we can do in the service of that. So they're seeing things more clearly, being more in proportion to what's taking place, not being so reactive or overreactive. And that carries with it a great deal of stability and calm. And calm and stability and relaxation can help support that as well. So they work together. Thank you. So Monica, how does nutrition and what you put into your body play into all of this? How does it fit into this? Well, specifically in quarantine, I'm sorry if you hear the very old dog snoring in back of me. Um, (laughs) She's really mindful and really good at relaxing. So in quarantine, just like Krista said, it's people live on their little pendulums where they can either swing this way or this way, or they swing into equilibrium and it depends what way we like to swing ourselves. So some people have become demonstrably healthier in terms of what they're eating in quarantine because I have so much more time now and I'm cooking and, you know, I don't have a commute anymore. This is fabulous. And other people have spun it the other way and said, well, I'm only doing takeout now and I pop up from being awake and I go straight to my computer and I'm not drinking water and I'm totally destabilized. So it really depends who you are and how you've decided to reframe this new life of yours as far as everything, whether it's movement, mindfulness, nutrition, it all just depends on what you do or choose to do with your 24 hours in a day. As far as specific you know, foods and trends that could contribute to mindfulness and better sleep, that's something we address with all of our clients in session is we talk about sleep hygiene. And one of our questions actually is, what is the last hour before you go to sleep look like? And if it's, I Uber eats hundred dollars worth of food in, or I'm on Instagram eating 14 cups of caramel corn while I'm in bed, or I'm drinking four glasses of wine because it's a day that ends in day. These are habits we need to examine. It's not necessarily, well, people are eating so many far fewer carrots now that we're all stressed out. And yes, there are foods and, and the microbiome, which are specifically linked to mood and mindfulness and health. But we find that it's not usually as micro as that. It's usually health and someone's intake pattern is usually better evaluated on a macro level as far as very long periods of time and very discernible habits and patterns over time that all together holistically in a gestalt way make up your normal eating pattern. You mentioned sleep and it is my kryptonite. I do not sleep enough. I know I don't sleep enough. And when I do sleep, it is not restful. 
how important is getting a good night's sleep well, and a restful night? Nutritionally, night's sleep? I mean, it has everything or a lot to do with immunity, with your microbiome, with the hormones that dictate insulin metabolism and metabolism in general. And it's all part of this physiological biochemical loop. So the less you sleep, the more insulin you have, the more cravings you have, you don't make the greatest choices that in turn breaks your microbiome and can lead to some poor neurological health. So they're all related. So that's why we are so meticulous. And everyone's like, why do you care? Why am I talking about sleep for 20 minutes with my dietitian? And like, we have this whole sleep hygiene module that we do because it is so important. And it's the recharging your iPhone. Your iPhone doesn't work if it's not charged. So how do we expect to function on six hours of sleep a night, five hours or less? I mean, when you're a new mom, like it's like one thing, but you know, everybody else, <laughs> you don't have an excuse. So I think it's the baseline for all health behaviors. And unfortunately in our go get our society, sleep is for the weak. And that's just very unhealthy and we don't prioritize it. It's something that has to be worked on every single day. We're not like babies and dogs that just kind of dribble off every few hours. Saito, when we talked in preparation for today, you mentioned taking a nap. I, of course, chuckled at the thought of taking a nap. How important is getting enough rest for the mind and the body? So just like Monica eloquently said, we're constantly looking for the charger to keep our iPad and our computers and and our phones going. And we function probably very similarly. There's just a time of the day where our energy levels go like this, you know, and in so many parts of the world, there's a siesta to kind of just go along with the natural way of how our bodies function. And in America, we don't even look at that as an option. And here we are the ones with the most illness that we don't take vacations. We don't do any of that. And so, you know, there's a lot of studies that talk about just a 15 minute to 20 minute nap can keep you going for the next four hours in a vibrant state. And so instead of like pushing yourself, like, okay, and then I got the next four hours and you're dragging yourself through it and you're consuming more coffee or whatever it is that you pop in your mouth to keep your body going, instead of putting all those poisons in and the toxins, just give yourself that 15 minutes to recharge and then your body can function naturally the way it's supposed to. But just like Monica said, we're in this go, go, go mentality, even when the whole global society is supposed to be reflecting and resting and figuring this out. And I'm a cancer survivor, as I mentioned in our pre-talk, and everything that I went through as a cancer survivor where I had to feel like I still had to go to work. I had to prove myself. I had to, I'm going to overcome this illness. I don't want to be like I'm sick. I don't want, you know, the second I accepted it and said, you know what, Saida, you have cancer. This is the reality of things. Let yourself heal because in that fighting, I'm prolonging my healing, right? And so if I just give myself that time to heal, then I can recover faster. I'm stronger. I can move on. But it's this fight against we got to be normal. We got to keep doing what we're doing. That's prolonging our healing as a society. And so now we probably could have been done with this, but because we're fighting against it and not rethinking things together, it's prolonged. Our healing time is prolonged. Yeah. And Krista, I know you and I have had conversations about this and I know you you have some thoughts on this issue from an exercise standpoint. You know, there's some who think if I just keep exercising every single day or I go super intense every single day, it's going to be better for me. What does resting and getting good sleep or rest do for the physical body? Well, like Monica and Saida mentioned too, I mean, sleep is, it's one of the critical functionality that we do as human beings. And it really the way that the same way we say that the brain drives everything we do, sleep drives the brain. So it's why they use sleep deprivation as a form of torture. If it wasn't so powerful, it wouldn't be so effective, right? So 
there's like Monica was saying, when we sleep, there are all sorts of hormones that are produced when you sleep. And when you don't sleep, sometimes those hormones are increased by 10, 15, 20%, which then has people gain weight. Your metabolism changes. Your levels of cortisol and oxytocin change. And by the way, oxytocin in men Oxytocin is very common in women with stress hormone, but in men, it's been found to produce sperm or lack of sperm in certain situations. So when men are not sleeping enough, if they're attempting to have children, this has been found sometimes for lack of sleep in men that has a decrease in oxytocin. If you don't sleep, and by the way, Some people will say to you, you know, I was in bed for 10 hours last night. That doesn't mean that you slept for 10 hours. There is a big correlation with what we would call REM sleep, right? Rapid eye movement. So there are people that, and sleep studies will show this, that sometimes people may be in bed for eight hours, but the actual amount of sleep they're getting is only in 15 minute increments. So we cannot function when we don't sleep because of the fact that All of those hormones, our tissue repair is not strong enough when we don't sleep, our stress levels for what we can tolerate, oxygen levels get disrupted with these kind of actions. And the truth of the matter is, it changes our fight or flight response, which is what kind of produces that high intensity for some people that like to go all the time. So there's even for my clients that are really high endurance athletes that love that. There are some people that exercise because they have to exercise. And then there are some people that exercise because they really thrive on that endorphin release and they love that high intensity. It's kind of addicting to them, which is great too. But our tissues break down from that. And then we start getting injuries. Now couple that with sitting for eight or 10 hours a day and you've got a whole other ball game. So Definitely. Now, there are people that need more sleep than others. This is a fact, right? There are people that can survive on less sleep, but it is recommended that devices are a big thing. I mean, I don't know if you wanted to do a show of hands by everyone on the panel, how many people sleep with their cell phones out of their bedroom. But yes, I sleep with my cell phone, not even near me. It's downstairs in the other room. But the whole blue light and digital screening really affects our sleep as well. So I'm a big, big proponent of sleeps and naps if you're able to do it. I'm going to throw it out to anyone who wants to offer advice, asking for a friend, of how to get better sleep, how to get more concentrated sleep, perhaps longer if you need it, or just better sleep. What are some of the tricks of the trade to do that? Chris is saying going to bed earlier. Yeah. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) We always say you have to commit to it. So it's like anything. You're not just going to become this dog and just fall asleep wherever you are. So I would start with creating a healthy sleep environment, which is like your bedroom is your sanctuary. Your office is your sanctuary. Usually, obviously I'm not in my usual home office. I asked my husband to remove this bike, but marriage, he didn't today. So your bed should be made when you get into it. It should be very cool in the room. They say 68 to 72, which I used to think was like freezing because I'm from Miami and like we never had the air on, but that's the ideal temperature. You have an eye mask, you have a cup of tea, you have a relaxing ritual. And for me, I have digital cutoff time. So like I'm allowed to watch The Crown, so excited, in bed, but it's 30 minutes. I'm allowed to be on Instagram, but it's 15 minutes. I'm allowed to read on my iPad or an actual book for, I can't just read till two in the morning because I'm excited about my book, you know? So I have like an entertainment in bed, like my relaxation time, and that's it. And my bed is not for clothes and books and baby things and dogs. It is like the bed is for sleep. And I have my special pillow and my eye mask and you can get nice pajamas and you can use spray. It's anything to make your sleep feel special and luxurious so that it conditions you to like want to be there and commit to being there for a third of your life and put your phone away. That's great. Yeah. So I don't sleep with my phone in my room anymore because if I wake up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I'm like, what have I missed? So it's on do not disturb in the other room, but I do have a baby monitor in my face. You know, you always think that your baby is not breathing, even though they're fine. So that's not as neither here nor there, but you probably don't have that. So put your phone in another room. Side up. Yeah. So in my fortress of wellness, that's a framework that we have at Organic Oneness in our sleep module (laughs) talked about. And Monica, I'm so sorry to go against what you just recommended or your practices, but it says that the bedroom is for sleep and intimacy only. And so 
don't have your computer or your phone or read in your bed because what that does is it stimulates the mind and it conditions you to have to think. And so those of us that go to sleep, we start thinking, oh man, I didn't do this today. Oh God, and I didn't do that deadline and I didn't do, oh my goodness. Okay, tomorrow, this is what I'm going to do. And tomorrow I have to do this, this, and this. And you just start thinking and you have this whole list of stuff. And it's because we've conditioned our mind to think in our bed. So we have to redo some of our habits so that it does become this place where, okay, I'm going to go and be restful. And so you have to prepare your body. Think of it as a preparation. So I start my whole thing, my ritual, an hour before I take a hot shower, you know, I stop the electronics. I watch all the TV in the living room. Then I take my hot shower. Once that shower happens, my body knows it's starting to activate into sleep mode. Then I say my prayers, I say my good nights, and then I'm out. If I wake up during the night and I'm up for more than 20 minutes, I get out of the bed. I get out. (laughs) And then I do whatever I need to do to make myself more restful. Then I get back in because you want to train your mind that the bed is just for sleeping and intimacy. Yeah, I have struggled over the years with my mind just goes crazy and you have kids running in and out of the room and we have dogs in, in the bed. And I mean, there's just so much going on. But the key is do what works for you to try to get your mind and your body to a restful position to give you the best opportunity. And one of those things I think could be at some point as part of your routine could be meditation from what I've heard. And Scott, first I'm going to throw it to you and ask, can meditation be a part of a mindfulness practice? Is there a difference between the two? Yeah, it depends what one means by meditation, but there are many types of meditative practices from many different traditions, wisdom traditions, religious traditions, secular traditions, transcendental meditation, creative visualizations, chakra meditations, the list goes on and on. And there's mindfulness meditation. So if one were to regard mindfulness as a meditative practice, which is can certainly be the case. Mindfulness would be a type of meditation, but just like sports, you can do a whole lot of different exercises and engage in athleticism in many different ways. And those different sports exercise, different muscles, serve different purposes, leave you feeling different ways, et cetera. You could say the same thing about many types of meditation practices. Many meditation practices have as an explicit objective, and this is an overstatement, but to feel differently, to feel more relaxed, to feel more connected, to feel a greater sense of aliveness, to feel differently than one is feeling. And of course, to feel more relaxed, to your earlier point. And there's great value in that. And there's extraordinarily rich traditions. And I love many, many types of meditation practices and exploring them. And they can be very helpful for sleep. They can be very helpful for a variety of domains that we're interested in cultivating and developing. Mindfulness meditation practices, by and large, are about being more attentive to what you are experiencing, being more aware of what you're feeling, being more attentive and alert to what you're thinking, as opposed to lost in the thoughts, caught and pulled away by the feelings, overwhelmed by sensations in the body. And in that sense, at least at one level, it's about being present for your experience, which oftentimes can be an uncomfortable or unpleasant experience or state for which we want to feel differently. When we're in bed at night and we wake up in the middle of the night, if we have fallen asleep or we're laying there trying to fall asleep, one could say, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to have these thoughts that are about tomorrow and this and that. I would like to feel differently, feel more relaxed. And so there are meditative practices that can be helpful for relaxing as the primary objective. And for one who's become versed in and sort of has a deeper connection to mindfulness in those moments and who perhaps has been practicing on a regular basis as sleep and as exercise and as nutrition all are on a regular basis because it's hard to in that moment drop in that way of being a little bit more healthy. One can actually learn to say, this isn't the moment that I wish it were. And I'm aware that I'm resisting this moment of being in bed and being a little anxious or moving around or wanting to reach for my phone, which now is in the other room. And I know that's good, but I'm going to get up and get to it because I can't really manage this uncomfortable feeling. And that's where we spend much of our day in many moments of our life, whether we're aware of it or not. And the key is we're really not aware of it. We're making many decisions to feel a little bit better, even if it's just reaching for uh, something innocuous 
and no problem to reach for something to drink or eat, even if something that could be very healthy. So we become more aware of the state we're in, which is more to that than it may seem. And we, through practice, become more comfortable experiencing moments that are somewhat uncomfortable. And we also learn through practice on a regular basis, and even in those moments, that it actually is a changing landscape. It's not the thing we think it is now that's going to persist if only we could be a little steadier in the midst of it. And many mindfulness practices are in the service of developing a stable attention because it's as the attention starts to move around, searching, looking, moving into past, future, that we then rile ourselves up and then hoist ourselves out of bed. When actually, if we could have just steadied ourselves, we actually may have fallen asleep in three or four minutes. I'm going to try that. Thank you. (laughs) That's fantastic advice. And it is so important, uh, certainly, to get rest, sleep for your mental and physical self. And it's harder, I know, when you're working at home, as we've all mentioned, right? I mean, if you're sitting there and you're, some of the other panelists are saying they're staring at their bed because they're working, sitting in their bedroom because that's the only place they can work. And I know we're all, some of us that are working remote or have worked remote, dealing with not ideal conditions when you're either sitting on your couch or I think Christy mentioned it, you know, with your computer on your lap. What are some things, Krista, first I'll ask you, that we can do to help us given the change in working from home and how can we help keep our bodies healthy from a physical perspective and sort of counterbalance the stressors from working at home? Well, I think everyone's a little bit different. So I always believe that somebody should find what works best for them and start in small increments, right? So as Scott was saying, with meditation, meditative practices can be very challenging for people because just the sheer act of slowing down and not doing anything is really challenging for some people. So we start to try to get people to do something like, can you start with one minute? Could one minute start the day? So even if you're talking about going to bed earlier, well, where do I find? Maybe 10 minutes. You can always start somewhere. So what I like to try to give to people is you don't just need a physical break. You do need a mental break from work. Studies also show that there is a time frame of when people are most creative and when they should stop a task and either move on to something else or do something else to boost productivity. So we have people sometimes set an alarm on their computer. They really try to focus. I am not a big believer in multitasking. I am a big believer in focusing on one task for a certain amount of time and you give yourself that timer. And when that timer is done, you move on to something else. The other thing is getting up and moving around. So pulling yourself away from the computer, whether it's to walk around the block, whether it's to stand up and do a few stretches next to wherever you are, anything to kind of get your blood pumping, take a break from the computer and then sit back down and focus again is great. And I think since we're at home now, it's really wonderful. We are fortunate. The rest of the country is going through cold, but we are really entering the most the best time weather-wise here in Miami. So being able to get outside in the middle of the day, maybe in your house, if that's accessible to you and just walking around the block is even phenomenal. So being able to do that, we've created little bite-sized videos for our clients where they just kind of have an alarm that goes off on their phone and they have this little bite-sized video of five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes that they just get up and do this little exercise that's appropriate for them. And then they go back to work. So we find that just starting where you're at is the most important thing for people to do. Yeah, And maybe I know people don't want more Zoom and their Zoom fatigue, but maybe as an organization, you can have, I think you mentioned on our call, movement sessions, right? Where yeah. everyone's on and everyone just does uh, five minutes or 10 minutes uh, moving. Right. Saida, what about working at home other than the getting up and doing movement and then coming back down to your workstation? What can you do with your workstation at home that may sort of help? Thank you for asking. I actually set up three different workstations in my house and with the office, that's the fourth one. So between my family members, we kind of go on this rotation (laughs) and just to give our bodies a different way of being. So usually it's 
I'm sitting over in the sun for a third of the time where I eat breakfast and then I stand with my counter. And so I'm standing for a third of the time and then I'm sitting here at my desk for a third of the time. And then if I really want to treat myself, I go on the couch. (laughs) So again, it's to get the body just moving in different ways. And then it helps you pass the time. You know, I'd like to sit in the sun and I really enjoy it and I treasure that, you know, and so it takes me through different moods also of the day and it helps it go by quicker. So I highly recommend doing that. Just three different standing, sitting, And then at a higher level or lower level, just so that you have that variety. And I see uh, you have plants behind you. Yes. I have one. So important. What's important about having plants or having certain things that are in your workspace that may help with that as well? Yeah. So you can do tons of reading on the research that has been done between the interconnectedness of people and plants and nature the most recent one that I read, it talks about our cortisol levels, you know, so when we're stressed out, cortisol is released and it's usually goes down the path. You can feel it down your spine, then it goes out to the rest of your body. And so that's why when you get stressed, everybody's holding it like, oh oh my gosh. So when you have that happening, you need to relax yourself and just the mere sight of looking at nature and plants can reduce the release of cortisol. It can calm your mind. And so I highly recommend having as many plants around you as possible, going for a walk in the forest preserve once a week if you can, once a day if you're near one, but then also having it in your room because air purifiers, so the one that you see behind here, and then I have a spider plant all over. And So these are air purifiers. And what they do is they clean the air during the day and then they shoot off oxygen at night. And so if you don't have plants in your room, just think about, or in your house, what are you breathing in? So that's more stress on your body that you're not even aware of because you're breathing in the carpet, formaldehyde from the woods. If you have pets, you're breathing in their dander. So you're breathing in all these things without combating it with a technique or solution on on how to balance those toxins that are going into your body because you're overloading your body with a whole bunch of stuff that it doesn't need. So yeah, definitely a lot of plants, plants in your room, gardenia and lavender are good plants to have the good smelling ones in your room also because those scents also help relax the mind. That's great advice. Thank you. Monica, what are we doing as a society now as a result of COVID in terms of eating? Have there been changes to how we eat or what we eat or where we eat? Again, very highly individually dependent. And, you know, there are millions of people worldwide who were thrust into hunger because of the pandemic. And I think it's always important to acknowledge that if you gained weight in the pandemic, that means you weren't food insecure, which is something to really be quite grateful for. And yes, there was a period of time where we all had shortages of our favorite products and berries. But if you kept yourself and your family nourished during this time, I think that's really significant and reminds us that we need to give back and donate extra food. So right now there has been a terrible hurricane in Honduras in the midst of all this. So sitting in my foyer is bags and bags and bags of food and canned food and things that I stocked up in March because I was so panicked. So I think we should all clean out our pantries this weekend and give to any needy organization. But now speaking of people whose habits have changed because we've all been so destabilized, a lot of people have found that because they've been robbed of their routine. So just like you have a sleep routine, we used to have a commute routine where, okay, I would go get in my gym clothes in the morning, stop on the way to work at the gym or on the way home. And now I don't have that anymore. Or I used to walk 20 minutes to lunch, or I used to go to this amazing place on Brickle right by the office and have a salad. And now we've all been thrown apart. So we're destabilized and we're overwhelmed and we don't know what to eat. And we've lost touch with our hunger signals and our satiety signals because we're not being mindful because we're now taking this opportunity to work all the time. And we're feeling a lot more stressed just personally and professionally, financially, all of the elites. So most people have complained that their nutrition and their health has descended, I suppose, as opposed to improved. It has worsened. One of my really good friends is a gastroenterologist and she's like, I've never had this much time in my life. Like I've never been home so much in 15 years of medical training. Like I got a Peloton, I'm exercising, I'm making salads. I feel amazing. I never felt so good. I'm finally listening to everything you've ever told me, you know? So it just, 
depends where you're planted and if you decide to bloom where you're planted or if you decide to wilt. The trends that I'm seeing in most people's health has worsened, which I completely understand. But a lot of people who had a pretty solid routine to begin with and who commit to health and wellness, just like they commit to sleep and they commit to working hard and they commit to their families are like, yeah, like it, my routine got weird and I didn't know what time to eat and everything, but not much has really changed for me because I had this kind of routine to begin with and I'm not someone to let that falter. Again, it really just depends who you are, where you started from, the, the position and privilege you were in to begin with and where you are now. And hopefully we all can just use this time to be gracious and have gratitude about where we are and where we come from and that we can nourish ourselves and we all have the power and the ability to make a better choice. Not the perfect choice, but the best choice for us in the realm of our food possibilities, which is what we do at at Essence Nutrition. We don't aim for perfect robot people. You know, we aim for if you started from an F and we get you to a D, like that is amazing. Let's celebrate. If you're an A++++ and we're going to get you, we're going to find something you're doing wrong and get you to an A++++++++. So short answer. I appreciate that. So it's okay to eat ice cream every now and again. If you're- yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we subscribe to something called intuitive and mindful eating, which Mr. Rogers will probably appreciate. Sorry about the dog. So I brought you up here so you would stop snoring. And that essentially means that all foods fit, like all foods are on the table. If you have the ability to eat orally and afford food, that's amazing. You should celebrate that. And if you love ice cream, you should have ice cream when you darn well feel like it. Now, if it's happening every single night, then that requires unpacking of what is ice cream doing for me beyond nourishing me? I think there's a place for ice cream that's not just physical and oh, I like it and it's amazing. So I'm the one in the family and the group that plans the menus, plans the restaurants. I'm the one doing the Thanksgiving menu. I'm the one baking the crazy complicated things and desserts because I'm so obsessed in a healthy way with food and I respect food and I like love food and everything that it does. And I'm the one who like only loves the frosting and everyone's like, I've never seen so much frosting. And it's because I don't do that every single night because food for me is nourishing and physical and mind and body, but it's not a coping mechanism or a crutch, or it doesn't have a place beyond a healthy orbit. And I know that sounds very obtuse and ambiguous, but I can explain it better in sessions. <laughs> I appreciate that. So we've got about 10 more minutes before I get to sort of wrap up and asking panelists for sort of put on their glasses to look into the future. I wanted to ask Scott, what are some takeaways for our audience to help them if they're interested in starting a mindfulness practice? How can one go about doing, I know that's sort of a crazy, maybe loaded question, but takeaways to some people like myself who are just coming to learn about mindfulness and how can one get into and start a practice? Well, for example, right now we could all, we're breathing already, probably enough maybe breathing a little shallower depending on where our mind is or isn't, but we're breathing. And uh, many meditative and mindfulness practices engage the breath. And so a part of your answer is a very practical one, which is now we're taking a breath. We could slow down this breath we're taking. So that's a relaxation practice. So we could all breathe in a little slower, a little more deeply. Breathe out a little fuller, slightly more tempered, but complete exhalation. And this engages a shift in our nervous system arousal on a reliable basis. That was a relaxation practice, not a mindfulness practice. But we could do the exact same thing now, aware, and we probably were before, so it was mindful, but more explicitly aware of this in-breath that we're taking, the feeling, the sensations of that in-breath. And we can be aware of the slow exhalation as the air leaves the body. And what we've done is we've brought together a little bit of relaxation and a mindful awareness of our experience. Now, of course, we're probably breathing now again the way we were a moment ago. It's shifting back to a more natural and spontaneous state, whatever that may be. And it's changing all day long based on what we're experiencing and it's affecting us. We could even be aware of this breath that we're taking now without trying to change it to feel differently. This would be a little bit of a shift from trying to feel a little differently to just being aware of what we're experiencing. But our attention is very much directed intentionally. And so if we're interested in starting a mindfulness practice, well, there's one that says, okay, maybe I can take a slower, deeper breath every now and again. And I could also realize that while that's relaxing and calming, usually a little bit, I could also be a little bit more aware of that experience. That aware of the experience is the real invitation because we're always having experiences and we're oftentimes not really there 
as fully as we could be, our mind is wandering, for example, and we're missing information and or we're reaching for food or we're not exercising when because there's maybe a story we're telling ourselves about what we have to be doing or need to be doing. And we're believing that story, though it's not actually in alignment with reality. And we're not even aware we're telling ourselves that story. So we can begin a mindfulness practice by A, being a little bit more aware of our experience, knowing that it can be in as little as the breath we're taking, but also know that there is a real training of our attention. So much of mindfulness practices are really concentration practices, the way they're first explored and learned. You're concentrating your attention on an object. That object oftentimes is the breath. It need not be the breath. It can be the person who you're speaking with. It could be the candle that you find compelling. It could be your own mind, although that can be challenging to pay attention to. And so we rest our attention on an object that's somewhat neutral, like the breath. And the breath serves multiple purposes because it can be relaxing. And when our mind wanders, which it will, we gently bring our attention back, known as the focused attention practice. And there's an abundance of research. The research is still new enough that we have a lot to learn and we will learn. And so let yourself be your own best judge of this experience for yourself and its benefits. But at night, when you're in bed trying to fall asleep, rest your attention on an object like the breath or the sensations of your hands or the snuggliness of what you're sleeping with or have over you with the intention to stay there, which takes practice. Then when the mind wanders, which it will, gently bring your attention back. To do that practice on a regular basis, importantly, is not about not having a mind that wanders, because that's just what it does, and thank goodness. And it's not about staying with the breath, staying with the breath, staying with the breath, although that's helpful. It's about noticing when the mind wanders and noticing it sooner and sooner and sooner, because you're actually on the lookout for your wandering mind. And then when you realize that your mind wanders sooner and sooner and sooner because you've been practicing that, you find yourself less riled up because you've caught the riling up factor, which is the wandering mind, sooner. And then you have this choice. And how wonderful to have the choice to either do that, which you are inclined to do with where your mind is taking you, or to say, wait a minute, where was I a moment ago? Where do I want to be? And to return to the breath or the object of your attention. And there's nice research that the structure and function of the brain changes, especially when we do practices like this on an ongoing basis to develop that capacity so that in those moments when we're getting frustrated that we can't fall asleep or agitated, we actually are more skillful at bringing about the intention that we desire. And in all of the domains that we're exploring, and each of the domains that we're exploring here, I just love our panel, they're all so fundamental and they support and reinforce each other. So what happens next? I think everyone agrees that given the shift in people working from home, COVID issues, people aren't traveling as much, people have changed. Life is not going to go back to 100% of what it was before COVID. I think everyone is in agreement to that. But what's going to be next? Like, What are the changes that you all see? And I'll open up to the panel, whoever wants to start, in your discipline or what you see in terms of physical and mental health and how people either focus more on it, focus less on it, how they do it. What do you see? Monica, you want to start us? Well, first we can all take a nap. (laughs) I mean, so I I actually tell my husband this because I know most of us are working. Some people are not working from home, but you know, my husband's working from home. He no longer has like a 30 minute each way commute. And I'm like, you know, you could steal upstairs for an hour and take a nap. Like you're not hourly, you know, (laughs) like they wouldn't know and you would still get all of your work done and it would make you more productive. And then you wouldn't have your second coffee at 4 PM because that nap would energize you. So I would campaign. And if you've ever been to Spain, like everything closes from two to 4 PM and it's very annoying if you'd like to get anything done, but like bring back the nap. And I always say, reclaim your lunch hour, especially if you're here, you don't need to eat lunch on top of your computer with the keyboard crumbs everywhere. Do you deserve 30 minutes to eat? I'm fairly certain as the boss here, you would allow that. So we could all mindfully eat and pay attention to what we're eating and appreciate it and connect with our food and our family or whoever's home, dog, whatever, or take a walk. So I would rally for everyone to examine where we are right now, as far as be very honest and open with yourself. And it could be painful as far as what you're eating and drinking in a day, why, what times, how, what are you paying for it? Is it prepared? Are you making it? Are you happy about it? Are you sad about it? How do you feel? How's your health check in? I would do an assessment top to bottom of your food life and say, hmm, what are things that I could use 
some more unpacking around and why is this happening? And is there any way I might want to improve and not should improve because should means it's an external force. And yeah, we're happy to pick that apart for you, but don't come here because I always say like when people are like, oh, I really need to send my husband to you. I'm like, no, your husband can get our email and email in and make an appointment, his grown up self, because if you're sending him, it's going to be a terrible experience for him at us. So choose the things that you would like to work on with food. Maybe it's just, you know what? I just need to drink more water and that's my journey. And that's all I want to do. Great. Then you became healthier. Wonderful. So do a little pulse check, check your pulse and see where and if you'd like to improve your home. Why not? What else do you have to do? (laughs) Saida or Krista or Scott, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Part of what I do is I co-create with communities to create a better place for everyone. So I would... As an individual, yes, do the assessment that Monica just talked about, and you are in control of yourself. And then also do a pulse check with your family members. How are things working? How do you feel? What changes can we make to make it better? What has worked? And then take that into the workplace and really do an assessment there. Because if we're doing individual assessments and family assessments, but then our workplace goes against that, you know, and you're kind of fighting each other instead of encouraging all of the new habits on how we're going to survive and move forward as a society. Those conversations need to happen also. So I would encourage everybody to talk to each other, build community, listen to one another about what has worked, what are best practices, and then what's just horrible. You know, what do we want to avoid moving forward? What are some of the things that we can leave behind that we don't need to carry into the new way of being? I always like to beg basically leadership to allow everyone's voice at the table because everyone comes from a different background. Everyone comes from a different experience. And so although, you know, we're accepting of the parents that have multiple kids and okay, yeah, they'll get their report in later, there's still that stress of being late. So how can you alleviate all of that? And how do you work together with coming up with that solution? It's not up to a few people to make solutions for the entire whole. Everybody should have buy-in to move it forward. That's great. And I would second from like a physical perspective, if we look at the people that have unfortunately passed from this illness, They are generally people that were deconditioned from the beginning. There is a huge respiratory cardiovascular component to this disease, people that had comorbidities and things of that nature. And then the solution to this was people now being in a lockdown. And so now you have people that are not leaving their house. You have people that are considered the most vulnerable becoming more vulnerable because they are not getting the recommended amount of exercise that they should be getting. So I think when we come out of this, from a physical perspective, I think people should, and I'm not talking about being skinny because skinny and healthy are not mutually exclusive from each other. So it's just about putting our health and wellness at the forefront of a priority in our life. I think that is going to be crucial. And I think health and wellness is holistic. I do think mindfulness and meditation and mental health is part of it. I think physically it's part of it. I am a big believer that we don't stop moving because we get old. I believe we get old because we stop moving. And so I think that's crucial for it. I also see what they're calling the long haul for people that have contracted COVID and have recovered. There is still significant cardiovascular and respiratory symptoms long after. And we won't know the full effects of this probably for several years to come. So physical and mental well-being are going to be crucial coming out of this. The other thing is from a business perspective, I think especially in the United States, you know, I'm a business owner as well. And so in America, we wear being busy as a badge of honor. And I can tell you right now that being busy does not mean being productive right? So I would encourage everybody to learn how to be productive and not so much be busy so that you can have that extra time to do the things that are necessary to keep you healthy, right? To do mindfulness practices, to do walking 15 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be, I have to go to the gym for an hour. It could literally be, I took a walk around the block for 15 minutes. 
and that could be where it starts. Or I sat in a meditative practice or a mindfulness practice for three to five minutes. It just has to start somewhere. And I really think as an American society, we need to shed this need to constantly be busy. And that would be my two cents. That's awesome. God, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Uh, to conclude, to bring us home. Well, first, Krista, Monica, and Saida, what a treat to be with you all and to learn from you. And I've learned, and it's so nice to be sharing with everybody what matters so much to us. And I would simply say, A, sleep, oh my gosh, so important. Absolutely. Eating, diet, exercise. Without those things, the mindfulness piece is like lots of luck. Because I think sometimes people think of the many meditative practices involve doing something, like something else to do, to the point that was just made by Krista. And yet there's focused attention practices where you're focusing your attention on an object. And when your mind wanders, you bring it back. Well, we're always inclined to have our attention on an object and then our mind wanders and we just don't bring it back. But sometimes we do. There's a body scan practice where you sort of scan through the body and notice sensations in the body, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And that can be really important for decision making because we become more aware of impulses and cravings, et cetera. And we're always having sensations in the body and we're often aware of them. And we also have it where there's a practice called open monitoring, where you have this more open field of what's going on around me and noticing what's coming and going. And we're always doing that. And there's kindness practices, loving kindness, connection practices, where we feel kindness for ourselves and others, and we offer it. Nothing I've said, and these are four fundamental mindfulness practices, are things that we're not already doing as human beings, born with that capacity, and our day is flowing with those focusing, expanding awareness, aware of the body sensations, and having kindness fundamentally brought into our connections with others. So when we practice mindfulness, we're not really doing something new and we're really not doing anything. We're sort of settling into being more present for these capacities that are already hugely a part of who we are. And it's just that we're sort of busting a move from being inherently who we are that seems to be the struggle. So I would say that the reminder is when we practice mindfulness or many other things, we're cultivating that which is already fundamental. We're not adding something new. It's not something else to do. And the struggle is something to be aware of. It's part of the practice. Well, thank you all so much. I do think that health and wellness should be and could be uh, and will be hopefully ever more important and ever more present in our society, given what we've gone through and what we're currently going through. I could talk to each of you for hours on end. And so we probably didn't scratch the surface on any of your each individual expertise. So I just want to say thank you so very much for being here, for talking today about these very, very important topics. And let's all hope that we all get healthy and well physically, mentally very soon. And we stay that way for a very, very long time. So thank you all so very much. For more information on this show and other resources, visit FastAmron.com and connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at FastAmron. 